So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans. We are starting our study in the book of Romans today. Uh, we will go through the book, verse by verse, uh, line by line, until we get through. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoy uh, preparing a sermon for it. Today I want to talk to you about ready for Rome. Ready for Rome. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, we encourage that. Number one, Paul presented his credentials. Paul presented his credentials. And we know that that is very important to know who he was and what he was about. Number two, Paul expressed his desire. Paul expressed his desire. And number three, Paul shared his heart. And uh, I'm telling you, the two verses uh, in the end of this text that we are reading, uh, verse 16 and 17, are the core of all the book of Romans, verse 16 and 17. And uh, we will be there in just a little while. You know, the Apostle Paul was the author of the book of Romans. Uh, he wrote Romans on his third missionary journey while ministering at Corinth around A.D. 58. Paul had not been to Rome, but had a desire to go minister there. The first church in Rome was probably started by Christians who came, uh, came there from Judea, and probably the Acts 2 church. Uh, there was representatives there, uh, which we studied the book of Acts before we did Romans. The book of Romans contains the Roman road to salvation, which has saved many, many people throughout all of history. Many early revivals in the Reformation period, plus much of uh, the history of Christians, have all been influenced by the book of Romans. John Calvin said, when anyone gains the knowledge of this holy book, he has an, entr an entrance into some of the most hidden treasure of Scripture. I cannot tell you how excited I am uh, to teach this wonderful book and apply uh, its principles to our everyday lives. Let's dive into Scripture and let the Holy Spirit teach us in the Scriptures. And by the way, uh, salvation is seen all the way through the book of Romans. Many revivals were started uh, by the book of Romans, and many men were highly influenced by the book of Romans, such as Martin Luther, John Wesley, George Whitfield, and Jonathan Edwards. So let's begin in Romans 1, verse 1. Paul presents his credential. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And we know Rome was a huge city, especially for that day and age. Folks, it had a population of over one million people. So it was the, the Roman Empire uh, it was everything back then. It was strong. Everything that was strong was about uh, Rome. And Rome uh, was a very busy metropolis. And when Paul says a bondservant, you have to understand in those days, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Back then, I'm telling you, it, it was widely accepted and it was just a way of life there. But he compares that, folks, himself. And, and when you think about Romans and you think about the Greeks and all those, uh, they were the ones that were in charge. They were the ones that had these slaves. And for Paul to start out like this, he is saying, I am literally a slave to Jesus Christ. Folks, that means he surrendered all. That means he's under the authority of Christ. That means that he's not doing what he wants to do. He's doing what God tells him to do. So a lot of times we look at slavery as a negative connotation, but here he has spiritualized it and he is saying who he was. He was a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And you can see his credentials here. And we know the apostles, uh, the ones that were with Jesus, uh, and we know apostles were set aside. They had a special commission, a special assignment from God. But one of the things also was that you had to have seen the risen Christ. And some people questioned Paul's apostleship because he, wasn't, he did not do that. But if you remember in his salvation experience on the road to Damascus, 
Jesus struck him blind, and Jesus spoke to him, and in a vision he saw the risen Christ. So he was a bondservant. He was an apostle, apostle separated to the gospel of God. Folks, the gospel, you will see this word all through uh, the book of Romans. And the gospel is simply this, the good news. The gospel is the good news. And then he explains it, which he promised before through his prophet in Holy Scriptures. We are in the New Testament, but there are several. Matter of fact, there are 76 verses in the book of Romans that was quoted from the Old Testament. 76 verses. And in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 1.8, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 55, all speak of Jesus Christ in a coming Messiah. And so we can see here God from the beginning. He was in. Jesus was in creation. And I'm telling you, he began it and he will, he will end it also in the book of Revelation. Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, I am telling you, Jesus is the subject in Romans. Jesus is Lord, is the central truth in Romans, who was born of the seed of David, again, to fulfill the prophecy in the Old Testament. According to the flesh, he was 100% man and 100% God, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Folks, you only had to be around Jesus a few minutes to realize he was divine. He was literally the Son of God. We just celebrated Christmas and the virgin birth, and that's the difference between Jesus and man. Jesus did not have a biological father. His mother carried him, but Jesus was literally placed inside of Mary in the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and we see that he lived 33 years, 30 of those lot on our earth, and then he started his ministry for a little over three years. And the word holiness means set apart. Folks, we are called to be holy. We are not supposed to be like everyone else. We are Christians, and we need to be holy. By the resurrection from the dead. What is he doing? He's given you the gospel. He was born a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died on a cross, and he resurrected, folks. Jesus is alive today. We do not serve a God that sits on our mantle or a statue. We serve a living God who is at the right hand of God, who speaks to us, who shows us the way, who has given us the example, and who is coming back for us. If he came today, it would not upset this preacher. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. What is he saying, folks? We who are Christians were saved by grace. We are apostles. We have been set, set apart for obedience, to obey him. And folks, the key word here is faith. Faith. It takes faith. It takes belief for salvation among all nations in his name. And again, we know that the Roman... And, and they were just so different uh, from the nation, the Jewish nation. But yet, folks, the Bible tells us all through Romans, salvation is for everyone. Among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ, he called you if, if you have come to salvation. He knocked on your heart's door. He is wooing you in the Spirit to all who are in Rome, which again, he's talking about saved and lost people. I mean, when Paul was thinking about Rome and one million people, I'm telling you, his eyes lit up. He thought, I wonder how many of those million people are lost. 
How many of these folks don't even know Christ? And that's why he was wanting to go to Rome. He hadn't got there because he was already uh, in ministry. He was already in ministry. Uh, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, to be called saints. And saints are holy ones. They are Christian. I'm telling you, Steve, I kind of like that name, St. Michael. Don't you like that? Now, if you, <laughs> you talk to my wife, she may debate you on that. St. Steve, that, that has a ring to it too. Folks, we are saints set apart for what? The glory of God. We are saved for a purpose, and I will share that purpose and why I chose the book of Romans. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it right here, right off the bat. Folks, there is a lost and dying world out there, and we don't have time to be messing around now. You look at everything that's going on in the world, and every sign is Jesus is coming soon. And our job as Christians, yes, we need to gather. Yes, I love Sundays. I love Sundays. I love Wednesdays. I love those times. But we are gathered so that we can go out as Paul had that desire to reach the lost people for Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hold your finger there. And look at Acts chapter 9. Just go back to Acts 9. And this, uh, this is uh, Saul's salvation experience. And we know Saul uh, went to Paul and he was renamed that. And we know that he was blinded and God told him to go to a certain city. And Ananias was waiting for him. And Ananias knew who Saul was. And I, I don't have time to read the whole text, but he was simply saying, God, are you sure about that? Are you sure you want me to tell this guy? He may kill me, all right? Why have you chosen me? I, I'm going to tell you. I'm being honest here. I, I'm just a little scared about this. And God assured him that Saul, who is Paul now, was his chosen vessel. Folks, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when God gets after somebody, he will not let up. He won't. Look at verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine, speaking of Saul and now Paul, to bear my name before Gentile kings and the children of Israel. What was he saying? See, a lot of people in that day just went to the Jewish nation because they knew, and many of them knew that they were God's chosen people. But as you look through the book of Romans, you will see that Paul was the minister to the Gentiles. Okay, to those barbarians and to the Greeks and to those uh, who are just lost. And, and in Rome, I'm just telling you folks, you know, they, they had their games and, and Nero uh, just tortured Christians. And, and salvation was just so important. And Paul is sim God is simply saying, man, he's my chosen vessel. All right, I handpicked him. Verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias in his way, went his way and entered the house and laying hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias shared the gospel of Christ with Saul. Ananias told him what had happened. And he, Ananias said, thus saith the Lord. So Ananias got to be a part of Saul's salvation. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Notice the word there, immediately. Okay? He, he knew Christ. He knew something had happened. He found his sight. He realized that he was lost and that he needed a Savior. And so he, the first thing he, God asked us to do after salvation is to be baptized, and Saul did that. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So that is Saul's conversion experience, and those are Saul's 
credentials. Folks, I'm telling you, he was a man who had uh, been hand-chosen by God. He did three missionary journeys, and this is what blows my mind. In those times, he covered 20,000 miles. Think of that. He is either walking or riding a horse or he's on a ship. This man got it. This man was sold out. This man spent the rest of his life serving his Lord and Savior. It was a servant of Jesus Christ. There is no doubt in my mind who wrote the book of Romans. Not only do we see his credentials, but look at the second thing. Paul ex expressed his idea. Paul is expressed his, excuse me, desire, his desire. Folks, we all have desires, okay? We all have things that we want to do. We all have passions in our lives. And we as Christians, I'm telling you, our passions need to be towards the will of God, doing the will of God. Look at verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And again, he had not been there, but he knew folks that were in Rome. Aquila and Priscilla were two of his closest friends, and they were there. There were other disciples uh, that you will see at the end of Romans, and he lists those that were there. So he had kind of a foothold in that, and they had obviously communicated with Paul about what was going on in Rome. And so he saw, the, he saw the mission field. He saw the harvest. It was, you know, ripe. It was ready to go. And he thanked God for them and the church and the Christians that were there. For you all, that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. Folks, he is talking about the reputation of the church there. All right? And, and again, folks, it's great to have church. It's great to come to church. It's great to gather together. But our, our job is to go out into the, the community and to talk to people about Christ, to tell them about Jesus Christ, to share the gospel with those folks. And obviously, in Rome, because a lot of people say today, it, it's just so wicked and nobody will listen to me. Folks, I'm telling you, people are desperate this, these days. People are open to the gospel. And I will say this, it is not much difference in those days, especially under Nero, as it is today. And Paul was thanking God for them. And it says, verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I'm telling you, Rome was on Paul's mind. The Christians there, he prayed for them. He prayed for church leaders. Paul, I read one time when I was studying his life, it said that his knees uh, had calluses all over it. And the reason they had calluses, because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. Folks, I'm telling you, I would want a guy like Paul praying for me. We, as members of the church, need to be praying for God's chosen people. We need to be praying uh, for divine appointments. We need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel. And folks, most, most of the time, you can take a casual conversation and turn it into a gospel presentation. And that was what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, man, I hear that you are growing and the church is growing and y'all are winning people to Christ. I can't wait to get there. Verse 10, making requests if by some means. Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. What is he saying? Man, I've already wanted to be there. I wanted to go but I've got to figure, I, got, I have to finish up these ministries. He was talking about his work in Asia Minor and his work in Greece. 
And of course, we know the whole picture of Paul and and uh, his death. I mean, he was going to die eventually in Rome, but at this time, he had no clue. He had not even been to Rome, but he had that desire to go there. He was saying, I want to see you guys. I want to uh, worship with you guys. In verse 11, "For for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. I'm telling you, Paul is not saying I'm going to give you the spiritual gifts because we are given our spiritual gifts at the point of salvation. He's saying, I want to come teach you. I want to come preach to you. I want to come encourage you. I want to come share with you all these things. God has gifted me and and I am praying that I can come and I can spend time with you, and I can worship with you, and I can labor with you, and I can get to know you you people better. Verse 12, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Folks, I don't care where you go in the United States or where you go on a mission field. If there are Christians there, we can have fellowship with them. And many times, uh, and Scott, you know this, when we go on the mission field, that, that connection that we have with missionaries, that com- connection that we have with people that are different from us is a special connection. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, man, I want to come serve with you. I want to come be with you. I want to see this mission field Man, it is huge. A million people. I'm telling you, Paul was chomping at the bits to get to Rome. That's what he's trying to say in this second part. That was his desire. That's what he wanted to do. But folks, there's a thing called God's timing. He's just simply saying, I haven't got there yet, but I know God's going to send me to that place. Now look at verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered unto now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. And again, he's just saying that I I, I finished the missionary journeys, and my plan is to go from Jerusalem to Rome, which was a long trip. It was a, a perilous trip. But right now, I'm, I'm headed that way. I'm headed that way, and, and I'm ministering to the Gentile folks. And uh, you, you remember in Acts chapter 15 to where he said, he simply said, hey, folks, God loves everyone. There's no, there's no favorites with God, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. All right, you are welcomed in God's church. Now look at verse 14. He says, I am... I am three times here. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. You have to realize that there were some people in Paul's day and age that would not talk to someone that is different from them. They would not talk to someone that did not speak the same language or or have some kind of different dress on or something in, in their customs and even their traditions was different from them. But Paul uses this word debtor. Folks, we know what a debtor is. If you are in debt, you owe somebody some money. All right? And he's using this phrase as, God saved me. Paul is saying, God purchased me. I am a bond slave of God, and because I have salvation, I am in debt to everyone around me. And in our mind, logically, what we say, well, I don't even know those people. I don't even know that person that moved in down the street. I don't know these things. And Paul is simply saying, we as Christians have to get by that. I'm a debtor. You know what he's really saying? I'm a debtor to anyone alive and breathing. If they are in my domain, if they are around me, I need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And he names these two specific groups 
But he was, he was simply saying to the Gentiles, because in that day and age, folks, there was still a strong separation of Jews and Gentiles, even though uh, you know, God in Acts told Peter, say, if I, if I say it's clean, it's clean. Don't worry about it. All right, You reach everyone that you can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he says, I am a debtor, both to the wise and the unwise, the educated and the uneducated. Verse 15, so as much as in me I, I am, here's another I am statement, ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So he's just saying that, hey, when I get there, I'm going to hit the ground running. It's not going to matter uh, who you are, uh, the color of your skin, what you have on. doesn't matter whether you're a Greek, a barbarian, a Jew. doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. I am a debtor. I will preach the word of God, and I am ready to do these things. Look at Galatians chapter 1 with me. Hold your finger there and go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Galatians 1, 11. But I make known to you, brethren, his brothers and sisters in Christ, that the gospel which is preached by me is not according to man. Folks, I'm telling you, man does not tell a preacher what to preach. Our assignment comes from God. And I'm telling you, folks, it, there is going to come a time, I believe, in our days where they're going to try to censor our preaching and try to tell us what we can say and what we can't say. And as God is my witness, I will not bow to man. I will not. I will preach the word of God. If it lands me in jail, so be it, folks. So be it. Because I have been called by God, not by man. Not by man. And that's what Paul is saying, folks. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you had a conversation with Jesus, that is a revelation of Jesus Christ. His beginning started that way. And here in a minute, I'll share with you, uh, you know, what his seminary degree was, his education was. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, which former is past, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. You know what I call that? Our, that's, that's the old days, okay? B.C. days, before Christ. Before Christ. Folks, I was raised in church, but I walked out on God for two years and did not go. And just, I'm just telling you, I, I can relate to Saul and the Apostle Paul. Verse 14, in advancing Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. And if you want to go to Philippians chapter 3, and read the first part of that, it tells who he was and his heritage and what he did. Then verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. What is he saying? He's saying his calling happened. It happened at conception, folks. Listen to me. Life begins at conception. And Paul is saying, I am telling you, I didn't know it at the time, but God was going to make me a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood you notice when he talked about that in the verses that we saw earlier, he spent a few days with the disciples. But he left Jerusalem because God told him to leave. All right, He could have joined in there. He could have stayed there. But God had a special assignment for Paul, and that was to be the minister to the Gentiles. 
And so it was going to be a different kind of education there. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And we know that Arabia was a desert area near the Sinai Peninsula. And it was at that time, and folks, we're talking about, and, and the best thing I can uh, relate this to is the, a country preacher, okay, that has never sat in a seminary class, never, uh, you know, does not have a formal education. But folks, God uses them in these rule settings. Matter of fact, folks, I'm telling you, I don't think there's going to be a difference than these churches and these pastors that run four and five thousand a bit of difference between these that they're in these rural parts of the states and they're running 50 or less you're still called by god you still have an assignment you still do everything that you can to to preach to people and to teach to people and that's what paul is saying paul is saying i didn't have the jerusalem education I love this, but I had the Jesus education. I'm telling you, folks, we all need the Jesus education. We need to spend time with Jesus. We need to spend time in the Word. And I've got two degrees. I have a bachelor's. I was going to teach and coach. But when I was 50 years old, I went back and I got a degree, a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma Baptist University. And here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that degree helped me, helped me very, very much. I'm not telling you. Matter of fact, all the young preachers that have surrendered, I would encourage them to go to seminary. But, folks, you don't have to go to seminary to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach it wherever you are. Jesus is the best educator in the known world. So we see Paul's credentials. We see Paul's desire. And now the whole cusp, the whole uh, everything about Romans is in these two verses. So let's break this down. For I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Oh, folks, we get so proud of things. Man, I'm telling you, we get a new vehicle. What do we do? We just ride it around. We don't put it in the garage right at first so everybody can see it. We get a new bride. We get a new bride. What do we do? She's my bride. Steve and I both know that we out kicked our punt coverage. We, we know what we did. Okay? We are blessed with our wives. They're a blessing from us. And we are proud of our wives. Folks, I could not... I could not do what I do without Lori. I just couldn't do it. But you know what? What he is saying here, folks, he is simply saying here, you have to understand that it's not about me. Paul is saying, it's not about me. Paul is simply saying, we should not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody calls us a Christian, that ought to be a compliment to us. If somebody calls us a Jesus freak, I, I just when, I, when somebody calls me that, I just say, thank you. Can I shake your hand? Because you figured it out. Folks, we should not be ashamed of who we are in Jesus Christ. We should not apologize for sharing the gospel with someone. Well, I may offend them. Well, folks, when you think about that, I would rather offend them and they have had that opportunity to be safe for me to pass them up and they die and go to hell. You see the difference? We don't know who's saved and who's not. Okay? And again, I'm not talking about getting people's face, bumping over the head with the Bible, thumping them with the Bible, saying you're a lost sinner and you're going to hell. That's not the way to start the conversation. Okay, you are going to offend someone. But just life examples. Just life examples. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. 
It's not about me, folks. It's about Jesus. It's about saving someone. It's about God wooing them. It's about the Holy Spirit speaking to their heart. We should not be ashamed. I am a Christian, and I'm proud to be a Christian. I go to Rye Hill Baptist Church. I'm a pastor at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and I'm proud to do that and be that. We should not be ashamed, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Folks, there's suspects and there's prospects. Suspects is you, you don't take the time to figure out who they are. You don't even get their name or their address or their phone number. That, if you don't have that, they're just a suspect. But prospects are, hi, I'm Michael Franklin. Can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? And folks, I'm telling you, he's saying to everyone who believes, everyone is a prospect. Everyone in this building, everyone, everyone that you work with, everyone that has a ball game, and you go to these ball games, every one of those people, you don't know whether they know Jesus Christ or not. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to also the Greek. So he's saying, hey, it all broke out in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost. Many, many, many thousands of Jews were saved over the time period. But now it's time to get out of our comfort zone. It's time to go to a wicked city like Rome and tell the Romans Man, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. And, we, and Paul was going to Rome because it was a tough uh, mission field. It was a tough place. People died for the cause of Christ. Nero torched Christians. He literally put them in oil and burnt them in many places. So we have to go. We are commissioned to go. We are like Paul. We are saved. We are set apart. We are saints and we need to go, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, folks, the word righteousness or justified is used 60 times in the book of Romans. It tells us about faith. It tells us about how to win people to Christ. And the Roman road is the simplest. I use that still probably more than anything I do to present the gospel to somebody. For it is the righteousness of God which is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. This is one of the quotes of the Old Testament from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. Folks, I'm telling you, it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. It's all about faith. Two scriptures, and I'm done. Hebrews 11, 1. Let's look at faith real quickly. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 1. For faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Folks, if we could see it, it wouldn't be faith. Faith is trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Skip down to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you don't have faith, you cannot please God. You have to have faith. Okay, you don't come on your terms. You come on God's terms. You, it, it is God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is his mercy not leaving you to die in your own sins. He died for your sins. But it, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. What? The Son of God that he rose from the dead, that's the gospel, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then the last scripture, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Folks, God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And if you will ask for forgiveness of your sins, if you will walk in, in, in the light that God has given you, if you will give your heart and your life to Jesus, if you believe that He is the Son of God and that He arose from the dead, the Bible tells us you can be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of ourselves. 
but it is the gift of God. I want to ask you as we close two questions. Number one, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Folks, you have heard the gospel and you are going to hear the gospel all through the book of Romans. If you are not sure if you would die today, you would go to heaven. I would be the first one that moves during our invitation time. Just come down to the front. Just tell us, man, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. We will share the gospel with you. We will pray with you and tell you exactly what the Word of God says. And the second thing is, Christian, are you ashamed of Jesus Christ, our Lord? Folks, none of us as Christians should be ashamed. All of us need to participate See, there are some people that believe, well, that's, that's what we pay you to do. You're the preacher. You're the one that's supposed to win people to Christ. Folks, you need to read the Word of God. It says we all are supposed to participate in that. We all have a challenge. And could you imagine what would happen in our church if just everyone here, everyone here today would share the gospel and one person get saved this year? We would double our attendance. And here, let me put it another way, because this, this hits home with me. I'm a cancer survivor. If you came up with a cure for cancer, would you keep that to yourself? You'd share it with everybody that you could possibly share it with. Folks, I am telling you, we have something better than that, because people are going to die, and the gospel is salvation. When they die... They're going to heaven. It is that priceless a gift. And folks, don't keep it to yourself. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Romans. Thank you for the example of Paul. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that they would all have a prayer list. And God, I pray that this year, every one of us would make a goal to share the gospel with someone, to, to share and, and to see that someone comes to the saving knowledge of Christ. Lord, it could be a neighbor, a family member, a work associate, a friend, a relative. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that that would be our goal for this year. God, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, if we need to rededicate our life today, if we need to come for baptism today, if we need to join this church, Lord, I pray through the Holy Spirit you would speak to us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Romans. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If God has spoken to you in any way, would you stand to your feet and would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.